Gynecologists. What is the nastiest thing you have experienced while working? Gynecologists slash healthcare professionals what is the grossest thing you have seen while on the job? I worked as a medical assistant in a gyno office and the worst patient we ever had was actually really sad. She clearly hadn't bathed in about a week and her underwear were stained. She claimed she was having trouble getting pregnant and had a bunch of eggs frozen and wanted a pelvic exam. The smell when she took her pants off was horrific. I'm fairly certain she had mental problems because she proceeded to tell me that she knew how to kill a man and get away with it and could help me out if I ever needed it. Then there was the time I had a 98 year old patient with severe uterine prolapse. It was horrifying and made me never want to get old. The most interesting thing I ever saw was a patient who was originally developing as a fetus with two vaginas, but they ended up fusing together leaving her with a string of flesh that divided her vagina into two sides. She didn't know about it until she was 19, when the doctor had a difficult time putting in the speculum because he stuck it into the side of the string that was smaller. Before that no one had ever noticed. TL. Dr. Dirty Crazy Lady Vagina. 98 year old whose uterus was falling out. And a girl with a flesh string dividing her vagina into two sections. The double vagina thing is called a vaginal septum, and I had one too. Got it removed when I was 23. What's pretty nuts is that I'd actually had a couple of pap smears, and they didn't even notice it, until one appointment when I asked them what it was. The doctor got all excited and brought all of the other nurses and doctors in to look at my vag. Pretty freaking awkward. On a somewhat similar note on the topic of holes down there. I have had many hemorrhoid surgeries in my life. One time I was at a teaching hospital. I was a pro at this point. The doctor asked if I minded if anyone watched the surgery from start to finish. I said, sure, no problem. After numbing me up, he left for a second and came back in with a whole class of people. Seriously. 10 to 15 medical students with front row seats of mips, with the cheeks, tape spread wide open. I literally looked over my shoulder, smiled, and waved. Mipes is an open book. Okay, here you go. I was doing clinicals at a large, in a city clinic attached to a hospital. The first patient of the day was a woman in her 50s who had recently had a vaginectomy to try and combat vaginal cancer. They had gone and removed her entire vagina I've never seen anything like it. After we removed the packing, it was just a huge, gaping, dripping more in between her legs there was absolutely nothing left of her female anatomy. The worst part was how terrible she felt about the whole thing. She refused to let her husband see anything, and was in tears the entire time, telling him he should go see doesn't deserve to have him now. For the most part he just cried, attempted to hold her hand, and told her he loved her and could never leave. That is so heartbreaking. In a way, it's heartwarming that he loved her so much he didn't care about that and would stay no matter what. But so sad for the woman. I had a Bartholin gland cyst the size of an orange that took over my vagina in a matter of days. Had to be hospitalized for 5 days total, and I couldn't walk or sit up. Excruciating pain, let me tell you. The doctor was so impressed by the size and I guess disgustingness of it, that she invited student doctors, or whatever to observe. It sucked, glad it's gone now. But I'm sure I horrified everyone with that. I remember my regular objin shrieked when I showed her and said I can't fix this. Er now. I can't fix this. Er now. Words you never want to hear when a doctor is looking at your genitals. Yikes. I'm pretty sure it doesn't matter what part of your body they are looking at when they say. My wife's an ob slash gin. The worst case she related to me was a female inmate that had such a bad case of genital warts that it was impossible to discern any specific anatomical structures. It was just a giant mass of warts and infected discharge. She was also 10 weeks pregnant and still sexually active. Who would do that? Who would touch that? My dad is a gynecologist and told me this story. He treated a girl that had Trich Green. Foamy discharge who had it for months before coming in. He told her to take the medicine right away and continue it completely. A few weeks later she comes back in and she still had the green foamy discharge. My dad asked why she stopped taking the medicine and she said my boyfriend really loves the taste. I gagged so much. Damn it. I wondered why it was bad that the boyfriend enjoyed the taste of the medicine so much. Then I went back and thought about what you wrote. I hate thinking had the same thought process over the course of about half a second. My face quickly resembled some of the gifs on this thread. I was chaperoning a procedure my doctor was doing on a woman. 
She had an ingrown hair that had turned into a cyst on her labia. This doctor wasn't particularly good at cyst extractions and busted the sack. It sprayed in his face. I was retching and trying to console the poor woman at the same time. She was crippled with embarrassment. I actually feel sorry most for the patient. That has to be horrible to go through. Laying there spread eagle with some kinda nasty pss going on downstairs. And pretty much stuck there as the doctor mops her crotch goo off his face before he can continue. I felt awful for her. That was the first of many visits. Also. She needed to have an iodine pack. Husband refused to change the dressings. And was in a lot of pain. It turned into MRSA and she battled with it for months. Worse. Her religion required that she wore restrictive, heavy clothing and this agitated the entire thing. Why the would the husband refuse to give his wife the health cause she needed? That makes my blood boil. My mom has an open wound that she needed help with when she came home from the hospital after weeks of the IQ. My dad just didn't have the stomach for it, so I got to learn all about wound care and ostomies and other fun stuff. My friend's parents went through the same thing. Her dad passed out when they tried to show him how to pack a wound. Well that's a whole different kettle of fish. It's one thing to refuse. Totally another to pass out just looking at it. Everyone has different thresholds for gross. My mom's a labor and delivery nurse. So she sees quite a lot of cooch and swap stories with Ginnis all the time. I think my favorite story is the time she fished Easter grass that plastic string eats they stuff in Easter baskets out of a vagina. She didn't ask and the patient didn't explain. To be fair, that plastic Easter grass always ends up everywhere. Friend of mine in judo class did some of his gin rounds at a local homeless shelter clinic type deal. He'd routinely horrify me at practice. Worst situation he was in was this homeless woman who had a rainbow of colors coming out of her vagina. Each color distinct. Didn't smell good. He didn't know what the hell to make out of it. So he called in his preceptor, who was equally baffled. They ran some tests on her, and it turned out she had something like a dozen simultaneous infections of her cooch. My stepdad is a retired OBGYN with 45 years experience. He told me the worst case he ever dealt with was a patient he performed a hysterectomy on just after he finished residency and put the paperwork down he needed for board certification. The examiners noticed that a few days after the surgery, the patient needed 7 units of blood. The examiner was obviously concerned, so my stepdad explained to him that the woman's husband raped her days after a major surgery and she almost died. He still says that's the grossest situation he's ever been a part of. Edit. My stepdad saved her life and passed his boards. What happened to the husband who raped her? Was he reported? If he retired after 45 years and this was the end of his residency, we are talking about something that happened in the 60s or earlier. It wasn't a crime to rape your wife then. So unfortunately, I really doubt it was ever reported. It's things like this that make me very glad I don't live back then. It's like that is serious leaps up. It makes me glad I don't live in one of the countries where it's still not a crime today. Also in India, Indonesia, and Vietnam it's considered non-criminal domestic violence. Makes me sick. Weird. I'm Vietnamese and if you rape your wife, depending on your neighborhood, you'll either go to the cops rich or get stabbed by one of your wife's cousins poor. But yes, there are situations where it won't even be reported and the wife will just suffer. I was assisting with a pelvic exam in the ed. The PT's chief complaint was, gore stuck in my vagina. I thought she was full of pss because she was 6 weeks postpartum and had already had a follow up giant exam. But sure enough we pulled out 3 nasty ass 4x4s that had been in her back since delivery. Now I have been a nurse in the IQ and ed for damn near 7 years. And that was by far the foulest thing I have ever smelled or seen. She is lucky she did not get toxic shock and die. Moral of the story. Just because you always do a good job doesn't mean other practitioners will. I feel this belongs here. All thanks to you slash Banzai Panda. Or nurse here. This is kind of a long one. I was taking call one night, and woke up at 2 in the morning for a general surgery call. Pretty vague, but at the time, I lived in a town that had large populations of young military guys and avid meth users, so late night emergencies were common. Got to the hospital, where a few more details awaited me, pararectal abscess. For the stid, this means that somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the ps, there was a pocket of pus that needed draining. Needless to say our entire crew was less than thrilled. I went down to the emergency room to transport the patient, and the only thing the ear nurse said as she handed me the chart was, have fun with this one. Amongst healthcare professionals, 
vague statements like that are a bad sign. My patient was a 314 pound Native American woman who barely fit on the stretcher I was transporting her on. She was rolling frantically side to side and moaning in pain, pulling at her clothes and muttering Hail Marys. I could barely get her name out of her after a few minutes of questioning. So after I confirmed her identity and what we were working on, I figured it was best just to get her to the anesthesiologist so we could knock her out and get this circus started. She continued her theatrics the entire 10 minute ride to the O. R. Nearly falling off the surgical table as we were trying to put her under anesthetic. We see patients like this a lot, though. Chronic drugs who don't handle pain well, and who have used so many drugs that even increased levels of pain medication don't touch simply because of high tolerance levels. It should be noted. Tonight's surgical team was not exactly wet behind the ears. I'd been working in healthcare for several years already, mostly psych and medical settings. I've watched an 88 year old man tear a 3 diameter catheter balloon out of his penis while screaming you'll never make me talk. I've been attacked by an HIV positive neo-Nazi. I've seen sumps. The other nurse had been in there, or as a trauma specialist for over 10 years. The anesthesiologist had done residency at a level 1 trauma center, or as we call them, knife and gun clubs. The surgeon was ex-army, and averaged about 8 words and 2 facial expressions a week. None of us expected what was about to happen next. We got the lady off to sleep, put her into the stirrups, and I began washing off the rectal area. It was red and inflamed. A little bit of pus was seeping through, but it was all pretty standard. Her chart had noted that she'd been injecting fourth drugs through her perineum, so this was obviously an infection from dirty needles or bad drugs, but overall, it didn't seem to warrant her repeated cries of oh Jesus, kill me now. The surgeon steps up with a scalpel, sinks just the tip in, and at the exact same moment, the patient had a muscle twitch in her diaphragm, and just like that, all hell broke loose, unbeknownst to us. The infection had actually tunneled nearly a foot into her abdomen, creating a vast cavern full of pus, rotten tissue, and fecal matter that had seeped outside of her colon. This godforsaken mixture came rocketing out of that little incision, like we were recreating the funeral scene from Jane Austen's Mayfair. We all wear waterproof gowns, face masks, gloves, hats, the works, all of which were as helpful as rain boots against a fire hose. The bed was in the middle of the room an easy 7 feet from the nearest wall, but by the time we were done, I was still finding bits of rotten flesh pasted against the back wall. As the surgeon continued to advance his blade, the torrent just continued. The patient kept seizing against the ventilator not uncommon in surgery, and with every muscle contraction, she shot more of this brackish grey brown fluid out onto the floor until, within minutes, it was seeping into the other nurse's shoes. I was nearly 12 feet away, jaw dropped open within my surgical mask, Watching the second nurse dry heaving and the surgeon standing on tiptoes to keep the stuff from soaking his socks any further. The smell hit them first. Oh god. I just threw up in my mask. The other nurse was out. She tore off her mask and sprinted out of the room. Shoulders still heaving. Then it hit me. Mouth still wide open. Not able to believe the volume of fluid this woman's body contained. It was like getting a great big bite of the despair and apathy that permeated this woman's life. I couldn't breath. My lungs simply refused to pull any more of that stuff in. The anesthesiologist went down next, an XNCAAD one tail back, his 6 foot 2 frame shaking as he threw open the door to the or suite in an attempt to get more air in, letting me glimpse the second nurse still throwing up in the sinks outside the door. Another geyser of pus smashed across the front of the surgeon. The YouTube clip of David at the dentist keeps playing in my head, is this real life? In all operating rooms, everywhere in the world, Regardless of socialized or privatized, secular or religious, big or small, there is one thing the same. Somewhere, there is a bottle of peppermint concentrate. Everyone in the department knows where it is, everyone knows what it is for, and everyone prays to their gods they never have to use it. In times like this, we rub it on the inside of our masks to keep the outside smells at bay long enough to finish the procedure and shower off. I sprinted to the R central supply, ripping open the drawer where this vial of ambrosia was kept and was greeted by an empty box. The bottle had been emptied and not replaced. Somewhere out there was a godlisps who had used the last of the peppermint oil, and not replaced a single drop of it. To this day, if I figure out who it was, I'll kill them with my bare hands, but not before cramming their head up the colon of every last meth user I can find. Just so we're even. I darted back into the room with the next best thing I can find, a vial of mastazole, 
which is an adhesive rub we use sometimes for bandaging. It's not as good as peppermint, but considering that over one third of the floor was now thoroughly coated in what could easily be mistaken for a combination of bovine afterbirth and maple syrup, we were out of options. I started rubbing as much of the mastisol as I could get on the inside of my mask, just glad to be smelling anything, except whatever slimy demon spawn we'd just cut out of this woman. The anesthesiologist grabbed the vial next, dousing the front of his mask in it, so he could stand next to his machines long enough to make sure this woman didn't die on the table. It wasn't until later that we realized that mastisol can give you a mild high from huffing it like this, but in retrospect, that's probably what got us through. By this time, the smell had permeated out of our raw suite and down the 40 foot hallway to the front desk, where the other nurse still sat, eyes bloodshot and watery, clenching her stomach desperately. Our suite looked like the underground river of ooze from Ghostbusters second, except dirty. Oh so dirty. I stepped back into the ore suite, not wanting to leave the surgeon by himself in case he genuinely needed help. It was like one of those overly artistic representations of a zombie apocalypse you see on fan forums. Here's this one guy, in blue surgical garb, standing nearly ankle deep in lumps of dead tissue, fecal matter, and several liters of syrupy infection. He was performing surgery in the swamps of Dagobah, except the swamps had just come out of this woman's ass and there was no Yoda. He and I didn't say a word for the next 10 minutes as he scraped the inside of the abscess until all the dead tissue was out. The front of his gown a gruesome mixture of brown and red. His eyes squinted against the stinging vapors originating directly in front of him. I finished my required paperwork as quickly as I could, helped him stuff the recently vacated opening full of gauze, taped this woman's buttocks closed to hold the dressing for as long as possible, woke her up, and immediately shipped off to the recovery ward. Until then, I'd only heard of alcohol showers. Turns out 70% isopropyl alcohol is about the only thing that can even touch a scent like that once it's soaked into your skin. It takes 4 or 5 bottles to get really clean, but it's worth it. It's probably the only scenario I can honestly endorse drinking a little of it, too. As we left the locker room, the surgeon and I looked at each other, and he said the only negative sentence I heard him utter into under half years of working together. That was bad. The next morning the entire department a fairly large floor within the hospital still smelled. The housekeepers told me later that it took them nearly an hour to suction up all of the fluid and debris left behind. The ore suite itself was closed off and quarantined for two more days, just to let the smell finally clear out. I laugh now when I hear new recruits to healthcare talk about the worst thing they've seen. You ain't seen ps, kid. TL. Doctor don't shoot forth drugs into your taint. I think I need to take the rest of the day off to reflect. This is the kind of story that changes a person.